Hi, everyone. Again, I'm Ashley Bailey. I'm the Senior Product Marketing Manager at Veritone for Marvel.ai, which is our voice cloning solution. We look forward to meeting you in Cannes next year, but today we'll offer you a preview of what we will showcase in February. Deepfake technology has been making headlines recently globally. There was the reveal that Mark Hamill didn't actually voice young Luke Skywalker in The Mandalorian. In fact, it was a synthetic voice created by a company called Reese Feature. And then, as many, as many of you may have seen the 60-minute segment, digging into what deepfake actually is and how it works, that aired a couple of months ago. They kind of scratched the surface, I would say. back here. There we go. First, before we really dive in, I'd like to just offer some definitions because there's a lot of definitions floating out there around deep fake, what it is, what it isn't. Um, emphasizing the quote here on the right, the technology itself is neutral. Think email, for example, very neutral. And there's some good players and there's some bad players as well. As Pat was mentioning, creators need to take responsibility to try and help implement best practices to limit the amount of bad players out there. Speech synthesis, as we've heard for many, many years, is simply the computer-generated production of human speech using AI. It's been, actually been around for a long time. Synthetic media is computer-generated media, which could mean audio, video, or both, where synthetic voice is used to describe a voice that actually sounds like that of a real human. But a voice clone is an authorized custom voice model of a specific individual. And the biggest difference between all of those definitions and a deep fake is consent. A deep fake is replicating someone's voice or image and it's usually a prominent figure without their consent. And often, unfortunately, it's usually with malicious or even criminal intent. Breaking this down a bit further, at Veritone, when we're talking about synthetic voice, we're actually talking about two different voice types, stock voice and custom voice. Stock voices are high quality voices where you can choose gender, language, persona, style, pitch, tone, and more. But the voice is an actual human. It's not a voice that you would recognize per se. In other words, it's not a replica of somebody's voice. A custom voice is a true repl replica of someone's specific voice. It's their training data, and more specifically, it's their IP, it's their biometrics. There are two different modalities when creating synthetic voice, text-to-speech and speech-to-speech. Text-to-speech, which is more common, uh, uses text as an input, and speech-to-speech -speech uses an audio file. And with speech-to-speech, -speech, something that I find fascinating is you can actually use a trained voice actor to get the inflection and the way that person speaks, but the output would actually be in another actor's voice. So we're still using uh, voice artists, voice actors in the mix, but the output is in the original actor's voice. To help explain this a bit further, I have two audio clips that I will play for you. The first one is Mike Arthur's real voice. Mike Arthur is part of the baritone licensing team, and these clips were created with his full permission and consent, of course. So again, the first clip is his real voice. The second voice is his synthetic voice clone speaking in French. I'll play those for you now. Go back and get those. Edge technology and state-of-the-art design has just become a lot more narrow. Introducing the Hitachi Digital Projection TV. So that's Mike Arthur's real voice. Technology de pointe et la conception de pointe est devenue beaucoup plus étroit. 
présentation du téléviseur à projection numérique Itachi. That's Mike Arthur's synthetic voice speaking in French. Mike Arthur, I've known him for many years, does not actually speak French. Get back to the slide here. So you can see how powerful this is for creating personalized and localized materials. For example, training materials, podcasts, and even film and TV productions for dubbing purposes, all in the talent's voice and in multiple languages. So for example, and I'll be clear, this is just an example, instead of a disconnected voice dubbing for Julia Roberts, it could be Julia Roberts' voice in multiple languages delivering a more authentic experience for fans. The positive use cases for ethically created and distributed synthetic voice are vast. As you can see, we've listed a few here. We work with advertisers who with the permi permission and consent of their top talent, create a voice clone to do advertising and endorsement voiceover work. This means localized and regionalized spots can be created without the talent ever having to step foot into a recording studio. We have found that sports announcers, broadcasters, athletes, celebrities, and influencers are often in highest demand when their accessibility is actually at an all-time low. So this makes scheduling a nightmare or virtually impossible. That doesn't mean that they don't want to do these endorsements. They just don't have the time or it's very hard. Synthetic voice reduces the time needed to virtually zero minutes. Once the talent has uh, created the, and once we've created the voice model and they've author authorized that voice model and the usage, and that's in place. Localization is a use case that's coming up, up for us regularly lately, especially in podcasting. For example, we're working with a podcaster right now named Brian Barletta of Sounds Profitable to first translate his materials and then create audio files in his synthetic voice in Spanish to help him reach new markets. You can imagine how this could be used for audiobooks, voiceover for news, financial, and weather reporting, as well as scene narration in film, TV, gaming, and more. A very critical use case we've been seeing recently is the ability for governor, government officials to create announcements and public safety updates in their verified synthetic voice in multiple languages and dialects. Large corporations can leverage synthetic voice for training and onboarding materials at scale and again in multiple languages. And a rather uh, emotional and sentimental use case is resurrecting a past talent's voice or even preserving a voice of someone who won't be with us much longer. Working with the estate, the IP owner, if not the estate, and, the, and also the owners of training data because sometimes the training data isn't actually the same owner as it's not the same so you have to work with all of those parties once all of that is in place it is possible to do this in a transparent and ethical way that both honors the talent and connects with new and old audiences So while yes, there are bad players out there, just like with any technology, like email, for example, we still have people trying to scam us and phishing. It's up to us, you know, as, as technology creators, governing bodies like the Open Voice Network in this instance, to really help govern and instill best practices to limit the bad players and, and call them out. So synthetic voice and the use cases for good can be used in, in virtually across all industries. Here are just a few real life examples that highlight the use for good. And if you head over to marvel.ai, you can actually listen to the clips of Brian Barletta's voice in English and his synthetic voice in Spanish. At Veritone, we're very protective of the voice owner's IP and encourage individuals to work with vendors who take this protection and ownership very seriously, as seriously as we do and have a similar mindset. 
But to elaborate further, there are many ways to protect the talent and also protect the consumer. For the talent, remember this always, it actually starts and ends, ends with consent. There must be approval from the IP owner. And always be aware of content claiming tools that may be leveraged. There must be, um, uh, there can there can be disclaimers. You know, we for one are not in the business of trying to fool or trick anyone. So disclaimers is always a best practice and good idea. Um, at Veritone, we actually use an inaudible watermark and ensure licensing protocols are followed. These are just some of the protection measures um, that can be kept top of mind. And we encourage every, anyone who's interested to make sure any vendors that they work with have a similar mindset and always ask about these things. Um, look very closely at the contracts and get your attorneys involved. Make sure that you know, you know what, your, um, what your protective measures are. If you don't feel comfortable, then move on to the next vendor. That's what I would say about that. So again, specifically at Veritone, we have a promise for good. We uphold very high standards of security and ethics always, but most certainly around synthetic voice and voice cloning. We're dealing with people's IP. We take that extremely seriously. And moving on to my final slide here, synthetic voice, uh, as you can probably tell, is very near and dear to my heart. It opens the door globally for many positive use cases, including one that I, I actually didn't go over, and that's bringing vo voice to the voiceless, um, something that is extremely um, impactful. But it's just a sliver of what Veritone has to offer. We have a hyper expansive enterprise AI platform. We serve organizations all over the world across many different industries, including government, legal and compliance, energy, advertising, media and entertainment, retail, insurance, and more. So we hope to see you at the conference in February. Please feel free to connect prior to the event. And thank you so much for being here. I think we have a little bit of time um, for questions if any came through. So I could certainly comment on a personal basis, actually. I think I'd, uh, having moved from Ireland to Brussels and not being a fluent French speaker, I, I think I could do with this solution myself. Uh, <laughs> I could think of a lot of good applications and, and using it. So I think there's a lot of uh, very innovative uh, capability ahead. Um, I'm not sure if there's any questions in the chat there. Um, you know, one of the questions I'd have for you is, you know, how do you see the... Uh, people looking to embrace this solution as regards um do they what do, do they have concerns on um the the shared responsibility like you putting a lot of work into uh, making sure that you're compliant and you're building up trust because that's really important i can see uh do you see still think there's more to be done to so that people can really leverage this and and see how to do the best practice for deploying voice-based new innovative applications Oh, certainly. I think so. I, I think there's still a lot of communication and collectively coming together and, you know, um, instilling best practices around contracts up front. You know, what are the what are the parties that need to get involved and sign off on and, and authorize, you know, such as the case with res resurrecting a, a deceased talent's voice? It's so complex. You know, it's not just as easy as working with the estate. We have to get other parties involved. There's some vendors out there who will simply take the studio's consent rather than working directly with talent. We take the stance of this is somebody's biometric, this is somebody's voice, and we need to get their consent. So I think there's there's just a lot of best practices that the the um, communities at large need to uphold and uphold others to the same standards so that we can get to a place where um, where everyone is, is, is upholding those, those standards and that we can be an, a, a positive example for how that works. 
Yeah, like I can see, you know, when I was updating the view on the uh, shared responsibility model from 2019, one of the things I had to add in was the focus on data spaces, uh, which wasn't in the original 2019 document. But clearly in Europe at the moment, there's a huge focus on data spaces, whether it's the big data value forum by the association or the um, GAI-X, which is the new uh, industry-driven uh, data space forum or the International Data Space Association. They're all looking at the same challenge of how do you uh, take data and get it working across the ecosystem. And what's really interesting, which which I could see being applied to your solution uh, by uh, innovative companies, is the idea of putting data controls on the use of data so that you could give people permission to use your voice uh, for a duration of time or a particular ad campaign. And, uh, and, and that data could then uh, be linked across the supply chain. And that's one of the visions that the European uh, ecosystem is looking to achieve. And it kind of shows, you know, in, in the model I was articulating around the shared responsibility, the key role of that data collection and, and how data is managed across the ecosystem, I think is going to be innovative, particularly as you want to get innovative companies to use your technology. I think uh, that's going to be very important. Absolutely. One of the questions that we get asked, you know, one of the concerns and questions we get asked the most is what happens if I don't want to do this anymore? What happens if you create my voice and then I say, never mind, or, or the project is done and I don't want to have my synthetic voice clone anymore? We actually, it, it's the, the voice that we have is actually a code. And when and if that happens, we destroy the code and they're their synthetic voice with baritone not, no longer exists. Um, and so if there was an instance where there was synthetic voice after the fact, we would know that it didn't come from us, but we could actually look at the audio file and verify that based on whether if it had the watermark or not that we, we use an inaudible watermark and we can actually um, connect and, and tell where the, if the audio actually came, came from us or not. Um, all of the uses that we have in place right now with, you know, celebrities, athletes, and, and others is not open for it. Like people can't just, or individuals or companies can't just come and say, oh, I want to, you know, use so-and-so's voice. None of the projects that we have in place right now are that open for lack of a better word. It's all like very controlled. We help them navigate the licensing around it, the usage for it. And, you know, they're actually approving each, each project every, every single time. Um, yeah, we, we take a, a, a stance of just because you can doesn't mean you should. So um, somebody comes up and, and asks us, which has, has happened, you know, can you clone XYZ celebrity's voice? Um, we can with their permission. So if you can if you can connect them with us and we can get their verbal and written consent, you know, it's possible, but we're not in the business of just just cloning things just because we can. That's great. Didn't see any questions come through from the audience, so maybe folks are being shy today. <laughs> Yeah, there is no question. I think people are shy. Um, thank you very much to you both for your presentation. I said before, this uh, webinar will be available uh, for a few months in replay online, so you can share it. And um, yeah, thank you a lot. Oh, I see one question. How do you deal with intonation and voice emphasis when using a different language? Yeah, so um, the audio actually drives, I, I think if I'm understanding the, the question correctly, the audio actually drives the, the lip movements. And so once we get the audio, uh, once we get the audio file, and in this case, probably using speech to speech where we're using an actual voice actor who's getting the inflection and the, the emphasis and the way that person speaks, if it's not the actor themselves, once we get that audio file, that'll actually help drive the, the, the lip movements. 
in, you know, say it's a TV production or a film production, um, so that there aren't as many issues with that lip, the lip um, synchronization as you see with dubbing today. It's a pretty interesting process. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I was thinking on the fly as some innovative ideas to apply to your technology. And, you know, I was thinking of one particular story in the scenarios that I mentioned. One in the health and well-being area, we worked with a company called StorySign, which was helping uh, uh, ch uh, children to basically be able to read uh, books um, who are blind. And, and how do you actually convert text to the speech and, and to make that easier for them to do it. So we've done that with a, a number of books with a, a different recording artist, but I could see I could see more and more uh, social good where uh, people who would like to sponsor and support, for example, their voice being associated with particular things mm. might be another interesting example. So I think one of the important things as we look at some of this technology, which is extremely powerful, is how do we kind of make it understood and people can see the get it in the hands of people's lives and industry and really providing value. And, and I think that your technology is just amazing and uh, getting it into these innovative use cases will be very interesting uh, going forward. Yeah, that's, I, that's a really brilliant use case. I, it, and there certainly is, um, a lot of work to be done to break through the stigma around deep fake and and getting to the what you know what I just tried to articulate um, what the underlying technology is and all of those positive use cases and I think you're absolutely right there's just a lot of education that still needs to be had um, and done on on our side and other um, creators to really explain the positive use cases and um, and and recognize that yes, there is bad. You know, and we should all try and call that out and limit um, and, and govern as much as we can. Um, but there's a lot of good that can be uh, done with this technology. Another use case that that just reminded me of that we're not doing right now, but somebody actually at Voice 21, the Voice Summit in Arlington, Virginia, last week brought up was um, children who. Or, or anyone, but in this case, it was children who can't actually speak, can have the ability to kind of create their own custom voice through the stock voices, but playing around with the pitch and the tone and the style can actually, and, and language and gender can actually create their own custom voice and be able to have a voice when they've never had a voice before, which really just hits, you know, hits the heart. I, I thought that was another uh, just amazing and impactful, you know, social use case. Yeah, I'll give you another one that's a story from Ireland is we have a famous uh, journalist called Charlie Bird. And Charlie Bird is one of our uh, famous journalists uh, from our uh, uh, various news programs. But um, he, he is, uh, he's got advanced illness and he's going to lose his voice mm. in about three months. So he's been very public and open about it and sharing mm. it with the industry. But you can imagine him as somebody who's a great communicator and uh, will would love to retain his voice in a way. And I know it's another kind of a story, but you know, these are all kind of some of the interesting examples that go beyond the traditional industrial and business value stuff to really help uh, providing social good. And I think, you know, um, I'm always interested to look for those. I think it could be interesting. But anyway. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. How amazing it would be to help him preserve preserve his voice. I know Val Kilmer did that. We did not do we we were not the ones who did that, but Val Kilmer um, worked with a vendor to create a synthesized voice so that he can preserve and create new content with his um, with his former voice, which is uh, fascinating to me. So it sounds like we could go a long time talking yeah, about these think, cases. You know, we're, we're kind of finishing on the innovative use cases, both of us. So yeah. I think uh, I think that's really what the forum is all about. And World Day Congress Festival is going to be continuing that dialogue. So uh, I'm looking forward to it and I'm looking forward to meeting up with Barry at the event. Us too. Thank you so much. It was a great, uh, great webinar. Thank you very much, you too and looking forward to the World AI Camp Festival to 
listen to your presentations and to get more insights about AI. I hope you enjoyed this uh, webinar and um, yes, I I wish you a great day or evening depending on where you're located. Many thanks. You too. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye.